Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem maximum value of K coins from piles. We're given N piles. So for example, this is two piles. One of the piles has these three coins, one, 103, and this pile has seven, eight, and nine. Our goal is basically to take coins from the top of these piles. So in this case, we have two piles. So we really have two choices here. We can take either these coins or these coins, one or seven. And we're trying to, in this problem, maximize the number of total coins that we have at the end. We are limited to K coins. In this case, K is gonna be equal to two, but it's gonna be a variable or a parameter rather. We're guaranteed that each coin has a positive value. So the first place that your brain might go in this problem is backtracking. We start with zero total coins. We have two choices. We can either take one from the first pile or we can either take seven from the second pile. A good way to organize this though is if we go immediately to the second pile, let's assume that we can't then again take coins from the first pile because in that case, we don't really end up with duplicates. Like here we would end up with, okay, we can now maybe choose to get 100 from the first pile or we can get seven from the second pile. Here we might be able to get one from the first pile or eight from the second pile over here. This is kind of resulting in duplicates. So we really don't need to do that. So let's assume that when we get to this point, we can continue to take from this pile. Like we could continue to take an eight or maybe we could skip eight and go to the next pile. Well, in this case, we only have two piles, but it could be possible that we had a third pile. And in this case, we could start choosing from that. So obviously this is an exponential solution. I'm not even entirely sure how to actually formulate it. I think in the way I've drawn this decision tree would be two to the power of something. I don't think it would be two to the power of K. It might just be the total like number of piles we have. Either way, this is exponential. So I won't go super in depth into analyzing this, but I will say that we can actually do better than this. The idea is pretty simple once you know it, but it's all about recognizing what parameters we're gonna be using in our recursive function because backtracking is generally recursive and we are going to add memoization to this so that we eliminate repeated work. And that actually makes me realize that this decision tree is not entirely exhaustive. Well, in this example, it would be, but there is a better way to draw this decision tree and that's kind of the tricky part of this problem. We start at the first pile. So let's say we have a variable i, which tells us which pile we are currently at. And let's say we have a second variable. We could use k, but I'm gonna use coins, I guess, to make it a bit more descriptive. But this is the number of coins that we are allowed to pick. So when we start initially at zero, well, when I say zero, I mean this is the total number of coins we have. We are starting at index zero. We're starting at the first pile and we have two coins allowed to us, we still have two coins left to take. So now since we're at the first pile, we have two choices. We either take the coin from that pile. We have then one total coin. And what would be the parameters by the time we get here? Well, let's say we're still at the first pile because technically we could continue to take coins from that pile, but now we have only one coin left. We first had two coins that we could take. Now we can only take one more coin because we already took a coin. And the other choice is a bit interesting actually, because we are currently at the zeroth pile, the first pile, I guess. So instead of just randomly taking from the second pile, let's actually move to that position first. So we would update our parameters by setting the pile to now index one, and we still have two coins allotted to us. We don't have to take a coin from the second pile because this example is overly simplistic. We only have two piles, so it seems like there's a binary decision, but actually we could have multiple piles. And when we get to the next pile, we still have zero coins total. We still have two coins that we can take. And from here, we again have that same choice we did up above. Now we can take from the second pile, which I think has a seven. So we'd have seven total, and this would update our parameters to be something like one, because we're still at pile one, and we have one coin remaining. Or we could skip it, in which case we would end up at pile two, and there isn't 
a pile at index two, and we'd still have two coins remaining, our total would still be zero. And as you might guess, this is sort of a base case. We can't really go further because we're at pile two, we're out of bounds. Like there's no pile there. So we can't choose from that pile. And I guess you could say we could go to the next pile, but if we're going to do that, we're going to get stuck in an infinite loop. You can't just keep going farther and farther when there aren't any piles there in the first place. So this is a base case. When we reach the end of our piles, that's a base case. Or as you might guess, going down this path, where we're still at pile zero, we can choose to take the coin there. And it looks like there is a hundred. I'm using white on white, so you probably can't see it super well, but this 100 down there, which would get us to a total of 101. And at that point, our parameters would be still, we're at pile uh, zero at index zero, but we have zero coins left for us. This is another base case. Even though we're not out of bounds, from all of the piles, we can't take any more coins because we have zero left remaining for us to take. So this is another base case. And from this base case, we would return 101. As you might guess again, we want to take all of these return values. And as they pop up to the root, we are just going to return the maximum of them. And actually, this was a tiny bit misleading because from here, this would actually not return 101 up to its parent. It would actually return 100 because that's the coin that we took. And then the parent from here would say, well, I'm also going to calculate the other path, which would be if we move to the next pile. So we would be at pile one and we still have one coin remaining. So kind of like the same over here. You can see it's getting a bit messy now. But basically when we're here, we're saying we already took one here. Now we're going to go to the second pile and take seven. So this over here would return seven. This over here would return 100 up to the parent. So the parent over here is going to say from that 100 and from that seven, I want to take the maximum of those. Clearly it's 100. And it's going to take that 100 and add it to the value that it had, which was one. So 100 plus one is going to be 101. And that's the value that it's going to return up to its parent. Down from this path, we already took the seven over here. And the next value, the only other value we can take is eight. So from here, we would end up returning 15. So which one of these two, 101 or 15, which one of those is higher? Clearly it's 101. So that is going to be ultimately the return value in this problem. Now this was super, super complicated. I didn't really talk about how we're gonna use caching, but caching is actually really, really easy to apply once you know how to parameterize the function. And in this case, we have two methods. I won't get into the time complexity analysis right now because it's easier to explain when we're looking at the code. Now there's just one last thing that I didn't mention. Even though these are the parameters that we're gonna be using, how do we identify when we're over here, we're at pile zero. That's pretty obvious, we're at this pile. We're taking from the top of it, which is one. Now we're not actually gonna be popping these values because the way the array is ordered is the one goes at the beginning. If we pop from there, it's not gonna be very efficient and we don't really wanna have to modify these arrays anyway. So my question to you is then when we go to the next position, how do we know, how do we keep track of which position we're at in this pile? Because now we're at this second position, but if we were to choose like the other pile, we would be at the other position. We'd be at index zero over here, but we'd be at index one over here. How are we going to do that when we're doing this recursively? Well, the answer is we're not going to be entirely doing this recursively for that reason. I don't want to have to introduce a third parameter into this function, even though I think it would work. But I think doing it without a third parameter will save us on space complexity so we can avoid that and maintain the exact same big O time complexity by instead having a loop inside of our recursive function. Conceptually, the loop is going to be simple. When we are at this point over here where we have taken the one, we have two choices now. We can either make a recursive call over here to the seven, or we can continue looping through this array. We can say, let's now take 100 and then maybe make the recursive call or maybe take three and then make the recursive call. The only thing we'd have to keep track of is how many coins have we taken and how many coins can we still collect? This is getting a bit complicated, so I think it's time for us now to dive into the code where it's actually pretty simple.
So first, I'm just going to get the number of piles because we're going to be needing that a couple times. Then I'm going to create our DFS or backtracking or dynamic programming method. It's going to be recursive. I is going to keep track of which pile we're at. Coins is going to keep track of how many coins we can still collect. As I mentioned, one of the base cases is pretty simple. We go out of bounds for the number of piles which we uh, computed up above, it's n. So in that case, we would just return zero. The other case is if we've already cached this value before, which I'll talk about after because I think it's better to first just go through the entire logic. Before I fill out the rest of this function, let me show you how we're actually gonna call it. We're gonna call DFS, which pile do you think we're gonna start at? Probably the one at index zero. How many coins do you think we're gonna have at the beginning? Probably the parameter that was provided to us, which is K, so that's what we're gonna pass in. Now we have two choices. We can either collect from this pile at index i or we can skip it i'm going to do the skip case first because it's pretty simple so we're going to call dfs we're going to skip this pile so we're going to now pass in i plus one and the total number of coins we can still collect is unchanged because we haven't collected any coins yet so this is the simple case where we're skipping the current pile and for now i'm going to store this in a result variable but we're actually going to change this to our dynamic programming cache so this is the simple case but what about the next case where we actually collect from the current pile well i'm going to have a variable called current pile for that the total coins that we have collected from the current pile it's initially going to be zero next we want to loop through the current pile. So the first way you might think of doing that is create another loop. In this case, I'm gonna use J because I is already taken, but J in range, the length of the current pile. The current pile is at index I. That's the way you might start doing it. But remember, we can only take at most K coins. So if we have three coins allotted to us, but this pile has like 10 coins, we can only take three of them. In the opposite case where we can take 10 coins but this pile only has three coins then we can only take three coins we can only take the minimum of how many coins are in the current pile and how many coins we're allowed to take so i'm going to take the minimum of those two values and that's how many times this loop is going to iterate through remember in this loop we're only taking from the current pile well mostly let me uh, show you exactly what i mean but first let's take the current pile and add to it the coin at the current pile. So piles at index i, and which coin are we gonna take from that pile? That's what j pointer is for. So j, this is the coin we're getting, we're adding it to the current pile. Ultimately, we're trying to maximize the result and we have to be exhaustive. We have to go through every single possibility. So let me try to explain. This is the case where we skip the current pile altogether, but there's another case where we only take one coin from the current pile. There's another case where we only take two coins from the current pile and three coins, etc., etc., until we reach whatever the limit happens to be. So to enumerate every single possibility, let's make a recursive call here now. If we only take one coin from this current pile, then the total number of coins we could have is going to look like this current pile plus DFS on I plus one. Now we're moving to the next pile. And now the total number of coins remaining is going to be coins minus J minus one minus one comes from the fact that J is starting at zero. So on the first iteration of this loop, this will be the maximum number of coins we can get if we only take one coin from the current pile. On the second iteration of the loop, it's going to be the maximum number of coins we can get if we only take two coins from the first pile, etc., etc. So to maximize the result, let's take the max of this and the max of our current result. So result is going to be set to max of itself as well as whatever we computed over here. And then we would return our result after all of that is done. So I believe this is pretty much the entire backtracking solution. Now the only part that's left for us is to add caching to this, which is really, really trivial once you have all of this ironed out. The dimensions of our DP cache are going to be this, the product of this times this. We could use a hash map or you can create a two-dimensional array. I haven't created a two-dimensional array in a while, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to initialize every value to negative one. 
just to initially say that it hasn't been computed yet. And this is gonna be multiplied by the total number of coins, but I'm going to add a plus one and you're gonna see why, because coins is not starting at zero. If coins is five, we might use it as the index of this and we don't wanna get an out of bounds error. That's why I'm doing K plus one. But this array of negative ones, how many of them are we gonna have? We're gonna have an array for the number of piles. So I'm gonna say that for I in range N. And I guess I'll, instead of using I here, I'll just use an underscore because this is unused. So this is just a two dimensional array with these dimensions. And using it is as easy as doing this. If dp of i and whatever the coins value is does not equal negative one, then that means this has already been computed and we don't have to repeat all of this work. So we're gonna immediately return that. Now, if it hasn't been computed, then we should probably compute it right now. So instead of using the result variable, I'm just gonna replace it with this. It's really as easy as that. So I'm just gonna copy and paste it there. I'm gonna copy and paste it here, copy and paste it here, and copy and paste it here. This line is a bit long, so I guess I can shorten that like this in Python. But that is the entire code. So let me run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, it does, and it's pretty efficient. Now going back to the solution to talk about the time complexity. At first, you might think it's the dimensions of our DP cache. So you might say it's the total number of piles multiplied the number of coins we're allowed to take. It's actually even more than that. And the reason is because we do have a loop inside of the method call. So we know this method is only gonna be called the length of P times K times. Well, it's gonna be called more than that, but if it is called more than that, we know the result has already been cached, so it's gonna be returned immediately. But each time it's called for the first time, we are gonna have a loop. So we have to multiply this by how many times this loop is gonna iterate through. You might think first it's K, so are we gonna say it's just multiply this by K or multiply it by the length of each pile. Well, the length of each pile is actually not constant. Each pile could have a different number of coins. So instead of saying something like the number of piles times the length of each pile, so let's say that's P of I, instead of saying this is the result or this is the overall time complexity, I'm going to condense this into a single variable let's just call it P, which stands for the total number of coins, like the total size of this 2D matrix. Well, it's not a matrix, it's a 2D array because it's not necessarily rectangular. But this is probably the simplest way to represent the time complexity. It's gonna be the size of this multiplied by K. The space complexity though is gonna be less than that. It's going to be actually the number of piles multiplied by K. So I hope this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.